All right. So we got the HESI RN review here. It'll be a nice review of concepts for everybody. Um, and I also would like to go into some test taking strategies as well. So we're getting ready for the big exit, or maybe you're getting ready for your HESI in your course, whether it's MedSurge 1, 2, the concepts still correlate all together. All right. Um, <clears throat> In, in doing HESI remediation in the past, reviewing what Evolve wants you to do because Evolve, HESI is an Evolve Elsevier product. All right. Now, I've got five test taking strategies that hopefully you'll be able to utilize. Uh, but first, before we can even put test taking strategies into place, it's important to understand where you can best study from, meaning you have to discover where studying is more beneficial to you, whether if you rent, uh, not rent the room, but reserve a room, maybe at one of the public libraries around here, you and your small study group, if you prefer to study by yourself, where are you studying at? Is it free of distractions? Okay, that's going to be key to really not just memorizing the information, but learning it so you can recall it when you're sitting at your NCLEX with nothing in front of you besides a computer and somebody walking around looking over your shoulder, okay? Um, so you wanna make sure wherever you are studying at, some places that I used to go study for, for these exams were, I would go to the public library, the one um, at one of the large uh, state colleges here. I would go to Panera in a corner, I'd go to Starbucks in a corner. Just those are some of the places for me that work because my household was full of screaming kids. Okay. I'm sure you guys, some of you share the same uh, uh, similarities there. Um, so yeah, you need to make sure you're, wherever you're studying is free of distractions. It's a calm place. It's, you know, you need to, and one thing most importantly, I think a lot of us don't do I didn't realize this until I started reading the research about it. Don't study the night before. I'm telling you right now, word of advice, don't study the night before the NCLEX, especially, or your exit. Get a good night's sleep. A rested brain is going to be able to recall information better. You need to care for your brain like you care for that cell phone, okay? We charge it up. We get the best use out of it when it's at 98%, right? Works great at 80, 60s, 50s, no problem. We start getting to the 20s and 30s. We're like a little bit panicked here, okay? The app starts slowing down. The battery optimizer comes on, right? That's kind of what our brain does, okay? So you have to think of it like that. Charge it up the night before. Get a good night's sleep. If you can tolerate eating in the morning, do it, okay? At least something. Research shows that one, a good night's sleep, and two, a little bit of breakfast in the morning is great for a test-taking advantage. Now, specific to the HESI, okay? These are five test-taking strategies. One, you need to utilize answering questions regarding, uh, you need to think about using this tactic. You need to worry about ABCs, the nursing process, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, those are some of the ways that they're gonna structure the question. So you need to be able to combat it with answering the question with that concept in mind, okay? ABCs, um, those are gonna be helping you with priority questions, the nursing process as well, and Maslow. We can never forget Maslow. Maslow is used in HESI and it's gonna be used on NCLEX, okay? <clears throat> Um, normally, again, airway, breathing, circulation is the order of priority for nursing action in most cases, meaning intervention. What are you going to do? How are you going to keep the patient alive or stable? Okay. The process or ADPI, right? Assessment, diagnosis, plan, intervention, and evaluation is another tool for systematically providing patient care. So that's going to be the scientific way that you're gonna be thinking how you're gonna provide the care to the patient, okay? Whereas Maslow's hierarchy of needs is the order of the most basic human needs and should be followed in order to give uh, efficient care. 
Now, this is going to be based on holistic care as well. <clears throat> are you going to, you know, are you going to address somebody's toileting concern or are you going to address maybe their socioeconomic state? We have to pick one depending on how the question is being asked. Okay. You have to pick out trigger words. What are the words that are going to help you best see where the question is going? If you remember in, back in math class in high school, right? All of our favorite class, of course, they put those ridiculous word problems and we're like, oh my God, what are they asking us? Again, besides numbers, trigger words, meaning best, priority, initial, most appropriate, okay? First, second, things like that, okay? This is the most important tip for prioritization questions. Okay. Um, yeah. So for example, here's an example question. The nurse is assessing the client's condition after cardioversion, which observation would be highest priority, right? So you have one, you have to know what cardioversion is. Okay. Those of you who have been rotating through the, the hospital with me, you may have seen a cardioversion and what they do. Now you have four options. You have blood pressure, you got status of airway, oxygen flow rate, and level of consciousness. Although, yeah, we're probably worried about blood pressure and oxygen, and we're worried about all of them, okay? But the most important, if they don't have a patent airway, if we're not breathing, the heart's not pumping, we're not going to have a blood pressure. If we have an occluded airway, we're dead. We're dead. We're dead. Airway, airway, breathing, circulation. The brain can only sustain six minutes of an anoxic brain injury or hypoxia before brain cells start to die, okay? We can only sustain so long without breathing. Think about when you're swimming and holding your breath. You're not worried about your blood pressure. You're worried about coming up for air and breathing, okay? So think about airway from ABCs. Understand that maintaining a patient's airway is the highest priority when written out as a nursing responsibility when cardioversion is done. Okay, that was an example question and example answer. The next one that they love to trip you up on is um, either assigning tasks or delegating tasks, making questions. Require you to understand the scope of practice for nurses versus other parts of the care team. Yeah, right? The CNA, the UAP, okay? How they can, how they can help patients with ADLs LPNs can do med passes, et cetera, okay? You need to know your own scope before you can delegate to another scope and know their scope. You can also find the scopes in uh, the Saunders NCLEX book, the HESI RM book in under the delegation section or on the Florida Board of Nursing website. So you need to understand the different roles of the care team so you can see which tasks can be delegated Okay. If somebody has never done a process, uh, never done a task, you're going to need to one, teach them the task. Two, they need to return the demonstration to you to be checked off, just like revert it back to nursing school. Before you ever get to clinical and do an IM injection, you've had a lab about it. You've had a theory about it and you've had a check off about it. The same way before we got into, into clinicals, we did a skills boot camp. We checked you off. We made a legal document. That document's provided to the local hospitals, and that's how you're able to work as a student nurse under the license of the RN with you, okay? Can't tell you to go do something unless, you have, unless you've done it already and done it successfully, meaning somebody has observed, watched you, checked you off, and made sure you were safe. Uh, that's the of the most important thing, okay? Um, when you really have no idea what's going on in the question, although you should, you should be able to pick out three parts of that question and know what's going on, whether it's the vital signs, seeing if they're normal or abnormal, whether it is the disease process or the diagnostic test. You should be able to pick out three things from a question and know at least something about them. If you don't, you need to know how to use the process of elimination, okay? 
it's best to work your way backwards. Sometimes if you either read the answers first and then the question, or you read the end of the question first and then the rest of the question, okay, that can help you. You can narrow down choices to two options before you decide to pick one. You will have better chances when only choosing from two answers versus guessing between four. This is a strategy you can use when you've exhausted all other test taking skills and have no clue what the correct answer actually is. Okay. The next one, the last test taking uh, tip I have for you is the most important. I suffered with this one. I had a professor come sit me down and she's like, what do I, what do I have to do to make you stop changing your answers? This is back when we were doing paper tests so she can see where I circled and then erased on most of the things that I got wrong. Okay, I stopped doing that. During my NCLEX was the hardest part of that because I wanted to change it and I heard her voice in the back of my head, don't change it. So you know what, don't change it. There is research that says, unless you're 100% sure that your answer is not correct, leave it alone. Go with your first gut instinct. Your first answer is normally the right one. That nurse gut that you've created, yeah, that's telling you the right answer. Okay, so don't change your answer. And don't change it if you're in class and all of a sudden you're, the group is overpowering you, but you know that that's the right answer. Argue your, your stance on it. Because as you go further in your nursing career and you get more credentials and you get more degrees or what have you, you're going to have to take a stance and stand up or advocate for what you feel is right based on your knowledge, experience, and education level. Okay, so that becomes important. Do not become passive with your passion in nursing. Okay, those are my test taking skills. Now, let's get to the review. Best friend, this is your best friend for HESI. Okay, um, if you're one more test take couple more test taking strategies one if you know that you're that you learn best from auditory audio listening to people stick with that ask your professors if you can record them and then listen to them in your own time at a place that's free of distractions for you okay if you're more of a visual learner draw pictures draw pictures i had to learn the hard way. I was visual, so I'll share my story. Um, I was an AMP, and I couldn't figure out where all the organs were going. It was really a hard part for me. I went home, and I got washable markers, and I told my husband, don't move. I'm going to draw all over you. And he sat there, and I drew every single body organ on his torso, and it was fabulous. For like my first couple years of nursing, every time I looked at a patient, I was like, I could just picture Steve with all his organs that I drew on him. So that helped me really visual. Okay. You don't have to go to that extent, but if it works, use it. Okay. Uh, Picmonic.com has some great, great photos for learning nursing concepts. Um, you have to pay for them though. The, another way you can search, you can use some search engines. Pinterest is another great website to look for picmonic photos. Okay. And they'll have nursing concepts on them in, in, in a visual format. It's fabulous. Or if you've got time, when I went to nursing school, they didn't have all the uh, website interactive stuff where you can like click and color. That wasn't a thing here. We didn't have it. So I drew my own. Um, that helped me but you, you know what you get what you put out of the you get out of the program what you put into the program i'm just going to leave it at that okay um sometimes you have to take it upon yourself it's called the spirit of inquiry okay when you're hungry when you're thirsty for knowledge you go find it okay that's not a free pass saying your instructor doesn't have to teach you that's not what i'm saying i'm talking about you the student okay all right, um, let's get into it. <laughs> Definitely, I suggest reading chapter three and chapter four, especially chapter four, 
before you take the Hesse. These Hesse hints are huge, okay? Um, let's see here. What do I got? I'm going to start. Hold on. I marked some pages off for you guys. If you have trouble understanding how to uh, learn ABGs, Mike from Simple Nursing has an awesome video on YouTube. Um, it's called a Marchman, learning the Marchman, something with Marchman. Let me, hold on, let me look it up. It's a great video. It's like 40 minutes long. He does a video. It's called ABG Interpretation and Acid-Based Balance Made Easy. Super easy. I I like it. It's a really great video. I suggest definitely watching that before you sit down and take that. Okay. Now. going to start in Chapter 3. Okay. Chapter three is the more advanced nursing concepts. I just covered one of them by suggesting to you to make your study plan, incorporating that video um, regarding Mike from Simple Nursing. Okay. Next, on page 30 in your HESI book, there is some great um, tables to show you how the body compensates with blood gas values, whether it's fully, partial, or uncompensated, okay? In the video that Mike does, he talks about how bicarb will affect the way you're gonna choose metabolic or respiratory. I'm not gonna get into it because I can spend an hour doing just that. You're gonna need to know the different types of shock, hypovolemic, cardiogenic, okay? Those are going to be important for you. There's also anaphylactic, sepsis, right? Septic shock and neurogenic. Anaphylactic, we need to assume, understand the cause is a reaction to an allergen, okay? Hypovolemic, fluid loss, okay? Cardiogenic, you got some damaged heart tissue going on, ischemia or impairment of the tissue perfusion, right? The end result on that, decreased cardiac output. Neurogenic, that relates from a spinal cord injury and, se and sep septic shock, right? That's from some causative organisms, bacteria, okay? Normally. What does sh septic shock look like in a patient? You may see a question and they may present you with some vital signs or a lactic, right? A lactic acid. Above 2.0, we're starting to panic, right? We don't want a lactic acid level above 2.0. We also, you're going to see what? You're going to see blood pressure go down, heart rate go up. The, the heart is going to try to compensate for the veins becoming now, the arteries becoming dilated, okay? Because of the endotoxins from the bacteria, septic shock circulatory collapse that ensues with it, okay? On page 34, there's a nice table for how you're going to assess shock. I was talking about one of them, septic shock, okay? You may or may not see a question about mean arterial pressure. Those of you who have went to clinicals with me, you may have heard me once or twice so far say, hey, what was the map? when that we come around with blood pressures. If the map is over 65, we got a stable patient, okay? But there is some parameters with map. The best way to understand map is how to calculate it. That's on page 35, talking about arterial pressures. You should know how to calculate cardiac output, okay? And that that is on page 35 as well. Let's see here, what else? Popular items, popular items. Cardiac arrest, your code blue. 
Are you running to get the crash cart? Or are you going to stay with your patient and do CPR? Stay with your patient and do CPR. Okay, those are part of the HESI hints that you'll see in the book here. If you have an obstructed airway, meaning by a foreign material, are you going to sweep your finger in there blindly? No. Unless you can see it, then you can get it. If you can't see it, you need to perform emergency measures. Okay. Maybe a Heimlich maneuver on that one. Okay. But don't just, don't blindly sweep because you can push whatever foreign body back into the airway. <laughs> Electrolyte imbalances. This is huge. Page 44 has a table, 3-9. It goes into what hyponatremia is, hypernatremia. What are the causes? It does it with each electrolyte, meaning potassium, calcium, magnesium, and, and phosphorus, right? Because calcium and phosphorus have an inverse um, relationship. If phosphorus is up, calcium's down, or it could be inverted, okay? Remember that. You want to review your um, types of IV solutions, right? So isotonic, your normal salines, right? They don't cause the red blood cells to swell or to shrink. They're isotonic, keeping the red blood cells basically as they are, okay? Um, the osmolarity is close to the extracellular fluid or ECF. That's why there's no changes regarding the red blood cells, if they're going to swell or shrink, okay? Um, red blood cells are going to shrink with certain other solutions, okay? Um, again, page 45 has these tables in it. Let's see. Dehydration. <laughs> So back to the different solutions. Your hypertonics, those are going to have a higher concentration of solutes in it. Okay. What happens is you're going to have solutes move out of the cell and cause the cell to shrink or crenation. Okay. You're going to have your hypotonic solution, which you're going to totally swell up that cell, increase it because of the lower solute concentration, okay? Water particles will move into the cell, causing it to expand, and it can eventually lyse or break, okay? So you want to remember that when it comes to your solutions and what is the implications for them, okay? Whether it be uh, dehydration, what level of dehydration, where is it going? If you're looking at flow rate, okay? Remember, a micro drip is 60 drops per ml. Sometimes the way to figure this out, if you're doing clinicals and you go to spike a primary line, you grab in that primary IV bag and you flip it over, it'll literally say 60 micro drops in one ml. It'll tell you right on the bag, okay? That is a HESI hint for calculating flow rates, okay? Um, let's see here. Let's talk about, since we're on IVs, let's talk about the degree you would put in an IV. It'd be a 15 degree angle you'd go to put in an IV. Everybody has performed that successfully that I've seen in NUR210, okay? Um, mm -hmm. there's another HESI hint. This one's interesting. It says if an IV catheter is the suspect cause of septic shock or sepsis in a patient, you should remove that, place it in a sterile container and send it down to, send it down to the lab. Um, they're gonna culture that and then they'll order blood cultures. All these HESI hints, these are gonna be very important because this is what HESI is going to try to trip you up on, confuse you, okay? Um, we want to watch out for uh, edema. If there's any edema with the IV line, okay? If the arm, you got the IV in the forearm, the forearm starts to swell up, it's cool to touch. 
if it has a red line right up the vein that it's in, thrombophlebitis. And what are you going to do? You're going to remove it, put some ice on it, cool it down, right? You can only leave ice on for 15 minutes. Ice or heat has to be 15 minute intervals, okay? Again, your acid base balance. Watch that video from Mike from Simple Nursing. It's a fabulous video, okay? Your normal pH, 7.35 to 7.45. Your PCO2 is 35 to 45. Your bicarb, in HESI, the HESI book says 21 to 28. Some textbooks say 20 to 26 or 22 to 26. It all depends. So if you're studying HESI, make sure you know their lab values, okay? It's not going to differ much from any other lab values, all right? Um, so that's one way to learn that is by memorizing the norms, being comfortable with the normal values, okay? Now, if pH is normal and then everything else is abnormal, like your PCO2, your bicarb, you got a fully compensated patient, okay? There's a nice table on page 49 that will go through fully partial and what it is, if it's compensated or uncompensated, okay? Let's get into, let's see here, EKGs right? Your QRS complex comes from the electroconductivity of the heart, okay? Your QRS is going to stem from, in the normal sinus rhythm, the SA node is the pacemaker of the heart, and that rate is 60 to 100. Then you have the AV node, okay? 40 to 60. You need to re remember those, because that is going to help you determine what kind of rhythm or rate, what's going on with them regarding the electroconductivity of the heart, okay? And you need to know how it flows down electronically through the heart too, okay? Um, let's see if I have a page number four. Page 52, again, we're, this is all in chapter three. You definitely need to know the flow of blood through the heart, okay? Yes, this is a review, but you got to put in the work too, okay? I give you these page numbers. We go through certain concepts. This is for you guys to make a study plan, okay? Remember, you get out what you put into the program, okay? I can't, I can't say it enough. So you have the PQRS representing what? both polarization, depolarization, but then you have T waves and even U waves. It's important to recognize what the U wave is for, okay? So you have the T wave, no, that's T wave, the R to R interval, that's how we measure. So let me just show you. If you, I don't know if you're gonna see this on HESI, but you can measure R to R intervals, right? P, Q, R, S. You can review this on page 55. Um, the way that you count R to R intervals is in 30 large squares and multiply by 10 to determine the heart rate for one minute. Skip it around, skip it around. Let's let's go into preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative care. Your your preoperative that is where you're getting clearance. Your patient is getting clearance to go to surgery. What's going to happen with them? What type of pre medications, antibiotics? What type of skin prep is going to be needed? Do they wear contacts, lenses, eyeglasses? Did they get an EKG? That's going to be key. They need to have an EKG. They may be ordered a urinalysis. Um, some of these diagnostic studies, they go into detail in this book. Okay. If you don't have this book, this is a fabulous book to have. Um, it goes into every type of diagnostic or lab value in detail and what it really means. Um, 
every time I show this book, they said, no one ever told us about this book. I'm telling you about it included in your study plan. If I'm looking up um, a complete blood count, a CBC, I'm going in here to see exactly what it is. Your HESI book goes into it too, but this is added knowledge, okay? We can give you more. We just can't take away from you, okay? Um, so we need to go out. Oh, oh, and they might have to have um, an H&H, &H, a hemoglobin and hematocrit. They're definitely going to, so labs, going to check their medicines. You're going to make sure that they've been educated. Our job as the RN, we, do, we are going to prepare the consent form, but the doctor's responsibility is to explain the procedure. We will only sign as the witness. That is our job. We are the witness. If the patient has any questions about the procedure that they're going for or the anesthesia that they're going to get, you call that provider. You call that surgeon. You call that anesthesiologist. Okay. You are the one who's going in there. You're writing the name of the patient, date of birth. You're writing the demographics on there. Then you can write out as well in full detail. You're not going to write EGD. You're going to write exactly the long name of EGD. Okay. So no abbreviations on a consent form and you sign as the witness being the RN. Okay. Uh, we do not, we do not mark the operative site. That is the surgeon. If the site is marked, do not erase it. Leave it there. The surgeon will deal with that when they get the patient down to surgery. Okay. Um, if you need to shave the patient, you need to get clearance from the surgeon that they need that site shaved. Um, if there's any skin prep, if, if ordered, you get that done. That's all pre-op. Okay. Intra-op, this is where the counts come in. If you're the OR circulating nurse, or you're the surgical nurse, or you're involved in the surgery some way, shape, or form. Counting is key. A timeout is key. Surgeons, nurses, the whole surgical team in the middle of the OR will take a timeout. They'll literally say timeout, and they're going to go through the, they're going to verify the patient. It's just like the concept of checking your drugs three times before you give it to the patient. That's what they do in the OR as well with the timeout. Some of you may have already experienced the timeout if you've worked in the ER in any capacity. Okay, they will verify the patient using the patient identifiers. They're going to verify the surgical site, making sure they're at the right place, right patient, right time, right indication, what's going on with them, review of labs, what they have, and they'll confirm who's on the team. Okay, um, we need to, and in that time intraoperatively is where they make sure the suctions work and that they have. Um, all the instruments, everything's been counted. Um, you follow an aseptic technique, everybody has scrubbed in, okay? Um, some of your jobs, if you're not right in involved directly in the surgery, you may be the emotional support to the family at that point, all right? And then you have your post-operative. More, uh, You guys are going to be involved in post-operative quite a bit, especially if you're going to a med surg unit or if you're going to work in PACU, what have you. When the patient initially comes out of the OR and goes to a PACU, post anesthesia um, recovery unit, okay, post anesthesia care units, PACU, okay, that's where they recover the patient. It's a wide open area. Uh, those of you who are with me in clinicals, we rotate through PACU and you do get a stent in PACU, no pun intended, all right? Um, they get their vital signs. You're going to assess vital signs. You're going to LOC, dressing, the condition, the surgery, the pain level. Okay. You're going to, they do a focus assessment as well. This is where maybe they're going to set up the, 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 the PCA pump. Um, they're going to manage any pain with analgesics. The anesthesiologist is going to check on them as well. Okay. Uh, most PACUs use a scoring system. Now, once they get to your floor, you're responsible for the full head to toe. You need to document what type. Now, do we remove if the dressing is saturated right after surgery and they're on your floor? What are you doing? You are to, if it's not 
fully set if that abd pad is not fully saturated in blood like totally soaked like somebody took it into a bowl of blood and pulled it out type saturated if you can actually draw if it's like a drop of blood like this big you can draw with your marker that's the only time you can draw on the patient by the way you draw on the abd pad where it's bleeding at you like the shadow of blood draw around it you're going to date it and initial it you let the physician know Okay, you come back 20 minutes later, that shadow has gotten bigger. You're now going to trace that shadow around the other shadow of blood. You're going to date it and time it and initial it as well. Okay, if it's saturated with blood, you put another ABD pad on top of it, but you do need to uh, have a conversation with the surgeon and let them know, hey, your, your patient's bleeding. We're not going to rip off the initial bandage. That is the surgeon's job. Okay. Um, postoperatively, we want to monitor vital signs, monitor LOC pain level. Um, if there's any nausea, we want to assess the nausea because we don't want to rupture any sutures or staples. We want to prevent any dehiscence or bleeding or complications. If they have a Foley catheter, we need to make sure that it is patent. How much are they voiding? When you get report from your PACU nurse, you need to know, hey, did they have any outputs of urine, emesis, what lines, what tubes, what drains do they have? And you verify that when you get on the floor. If you've got a JP drain full of, of any type of fluid, okay, we need to let the physician know because normally the protocol is over 200 mLs, uh, might be in an hour, that could be the signs of a hemorrhage. And then you have your vital signs to go with it. Signs of a hemorrhage can mimic the signs of septic shock right? Blood pressure going down, heart rate going up to try to, the heart's trying to make up for the fluid volume loss that it's experiencing because it's trying to perfuse all the organs, okay? Because in blood, we have nutrients, we have oxygen that rides on the back of the blood cells called oxyhemoglobin. Once those get to the tissues or the organs, we utilize the oxygen and the nutrients, and it comes back up in systemic circulation, back into the heart for reoxygenation, of course, right? So we need to make sure that they are getting adequate oxygenation. Ad we need to manage their pain, okay? Assess respirations, most important. They're on these PCA pumps, they're on these opioid narcotics, maybe they had some fentanyl, Versed, who knows what it could be. You need to assess your patient. Okay, respiratory status regarding opioids. You need to verify their diet orders if they're MPO before surgery, pre-op, and post-op. Because if they had a small bowel surgery and they might need an NG tube for decompression, okay, either before or after if they develop an ileus, we just need to make sure what orders we have and what's going on with the patient and report it as such, okay? Um, this is where you can teach your patient about dietary um, orders. Maybe they're ordered uh, low fat. They had their gallbladder out, right? Cholecystectomy. Okay. They had the gallbladder taken out. They need to adhere to a low fat diet. This is your teaching. I had the, um, the, the honor of teaching a new diabetic patient with a student last week. And I thought it was a really great experience because they exhibited such uh, pleasant bedside care to the patients, a nice bedside manner, excuse me. So that becomes important when you're teaching people so they can recall the information. If you go in there and you're rushed and you're stressed, your patient ain't going to get it because you barely got it, right? So don't, don't go in there like that, okay? Um, and you want to monitor them as well for any pulmonary issues, urinary problems, wound healing, thrombophlebitis or decreased GI peristalsis, okay? That is important, okay? You need to know the difference between dehiscence and ev uh, evisceration, okay, regarding an abdominal surgery, okay? Um, wound dehiscence is the separation of the wound edges, which people with vertical incisions, like a midline incision, they're more prone to wound dehiscence, okay? And evisceration is, um, of a wound is literally protrusion of 
the organs through the abdominal wound. People who are older, diabetic, obese, malnourished, or have a prolonged ileus, they're more at risk for evisceration, okay? Um, there, another HESI hint, we already went over this, the timeout during surgical, okay? That is a protocol that's being used in the ORs. Your handoff report is key because that is gonna be the transfer of relevant information from the perioperative period to the post-operative period, meaning in your care, okay? Um, so don't forget those. Usually if people are gonna have urinary tension, it happens about eight to 12 hours post-operatively. That's why it's so important to assess and ask that packing nurse, hey, have we, have, it, have we had any urinary output? Monitor that on the floor as well, okay? You need to instruct that your UAPs, if they're emptying the Foley, they got to let you know. We need to maintain eyes and nose on that patient, okay? Intake and output. All right, let's keep going here. Know your norms or your vital signs, okay? Know your norms. Uh, remember your fifth vital sign, pain, okay? Remember, pain is subjective. Pain is subjective. All right. Let's see here. Mm -hmm. Your routes of administration, very important. You need to be comfortable with reading drug labels, reading doctor orders on how to give medicines. Page 66 in your HESI book has routes of um, administration. It, regarding analgesics, but it's still it's still important to know for other drugs as well. Um, let's see here, and that goes to page sixty seven. Okay, and it's you know it's got a nice table. This is really nice to look at because it has the onset related to post op care, the onset of common commonly administered narcotics. You got codeine, hydromorphone, your dilated, uh, morphine, and fentanyl. Okay. <clears throat> Remember, if somebody is experiencing respiratory depression because of an opioid, what is the antidote? It's naloxone, right? You can be, you can give that. Um, I think police officers give it nasally. They may do that in the ER too, or it can be given IV as well. A lot of patients, when they get a naloxone IV, they get itchy. Okay, that's one of the side effects of it. We need to remember our non-pharmacologic pain management, right? Relaxation, guided imagery, distraction, biofeedback, okay? Physical care, cold, hot, okay? <laughs> Another HESI hint here is remembering that narcotic analgesics they are the preferred pain relief because how they bind to opiate receptors sites in the CNS, okay? But remember, they do cause respiratory depression. If you do give naloxone, remember you're not gonna be giving another narcotic until the naloxone has wore off because it just won't have any effect, right? If you're putting the antidote in the system, okay? Still going in chapter three, it's going over death and grief. This is an important way to look, um, an important concept to look over because there's stages of it. Um, experienced it a few weeks ago, teaching that new diabetic patient, the stages of grief, right? She was in denial, angry, She's going to start, she was going to start bargaining. They go into a depression mode. And then hopefully if they reach the acceptance stage, that is the last stage. Okay. In um, loss, death, right? Shock, disbelief, rejection, or denial, resolution. And they have complicated grief, but some, they still share the same stages. Um. If somebody's in a crisis, right? This is a HESI hint. 
If somebody is in a crisis, do not take away a coping mechanism in crisis mode. Um, you're going to potentiate what's going on with them. Now, I'm getting into chapter four, the bread and butter of the HESI test, okay? Um, it starts out here with talking about HIPAA and therapeutic communication. There is a lot of HESI hints on page 71 regarding how SBAR should be used, how nonverbal communication Body language is key to understanding how the patient and cultures will difference. Okay. Um, you need to make sure that if you're going to change shift, you need to provide an S bar. Okay. A proper handoff, bedside report. Okay. And in doing so, you're going to assess your patient like an across the room assessment. At that point, you can look at lines, tubes, drains. Um, Remember, your NCLEX and your HESI is safety, has safety in mind. So you want to always think fall prevention, reporting changes and conditions, how the patient responds to treatments and meds, okay? How they tolerated therapies. That's important. Um, don't forget about HIPAA as well. If you're given a report and you have a double patient room where you got A bed and B bed, you want to make sure to lower your voice a little bit. I know you're not going to prevent every type of sound transfer to bed B, but you're going to try your, your absolute best, close the curtain, and maintain privacy that way. Okay. You still have to do bedside report. When you're talking to your patient, keep therapeutic communication in mind. Okay. Um, therapeutic communication can decrease the anxiety that patients undergo when they learn about uh, whether it's a treatment route or a new disease, uh, whatever diagnosis or prognosis they get, if you provide therapeutic communication, you're going to decrease their anxiety about what's going on with them. They might open up to you more as a coping mechanism. When you're talking to patients, don't forget to sit at an eye level. Sit down with them. Don't just stand over them. You're going to make them even more nervous, okay? Health and wellness is understood uh, best by understanding the culture of your patient. Different cultures have different concepts of health and wellness and what it means. Different cultures will treat illness uh, with maybe a hot and cold theory or a yin and yang theory. Okay, um, For a, a cold illness, they want a hot therapy. For a warm illness, they want a cold therapy. So... Uh, maybe with a cold illness where they're having shivers from a fever, they might want to treat it with a hot soup. Okay. Um, but cultural nursing is very important. There's quite a few HESI hints in your book about it too. Okay. Um, how do we foster healthy behavior in our patients? Well, we can teach them about exercise, diet, lifestyle changes, stress management, um, abstaining from tobacco, illicit drugs, alcohol, how they perceive their spiritual well-being. You can teach them coping and make sure or have them identify a support system. Let's see. Um, there's also a section regarding complementary and alternative therapies. Right. Some cultures may not want to be on Western medicine where you get um, a medication or a pill for every um, diagnosis that you have, right? Because that's what Western medicine does. You have hypertension, you're getting a pill or a diuretic, right? You're getting some sort of antihypertensive, but some, some cultures want to abstain from taking medicine. They may go with... Um, whatever their culture influences on them, meaning do they follow, do they want to do acupuncture? Do they want to drink herbal teas? You know, what, what do they want to do? Whatever your patient chooses, that's their right. They have the right to choose a provider that they want. They have the right to, to be a part of their, their care. And in that we can only teach and advise. Okay. There is a page 75 in your HESI book about herbal medications, their mechanism of action, and their side effects. 
Um, you should also know for certain medications, what, what drug to drug or what drug to food interactions, meaning maybe for some antihypertensive medicines, you wanna teach your patient to avoid grapefruit juice or if they're taking other types of medicines, what do they need to avoid with it? Some medicines you can't take with antacids, okay? Some uh, antihypertensives you shouldn't take with antacids because it inhibits the effect, okay? Um, I don't know how much of this you're gonna see on your test, but I have seen this on tests before regarding aromatherapy because it's an alternative therapy. How lavender will, will help um, with anxiety or breast tenderness or how sage can help lower back pain. All of this I'm getting from page 74 and 75. But they are starting to ask more complementary therapy questions because so many people are seeking alternate routes or Eastern Oriental medicine. Okay. Um, they talk about kava, saw palmetto, St. John's wort. Okay. That's a big one. They like to test on is St. John's wort, how it treats um, depression because it inhibits norepinephrine, dop dopamine, and serotonin reuptake. Okay. Side effects that can give bipolar patients mania or photosensitivity. Um, let's see here. Drug interactions. Many serotonin syndrome when combined with selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So your SSRIs, your tricyclic antidepressants, okay? Um, and this is a, a proven, proven method, but you have to be cautious of what meds you give with St. John's wort because some things should be omitted or not used at all, okay? Remember, for your respiratory patients, you're going to do a focused assessment on them. Don't forget to do capillary refill, okay? Um, pneumonia is, is one disease that can affect or one condition that can affect, especially 65 or older or infants under two because the immune systems of the infant is still developing, okay? Um, remember, there's another HESI hint in here regarding Again, we, we shift the gears to the respiratory system. Increased temperature also increases metabolism and demand for O2. Fever can cause dehydration because of excessive fluid loss during diaphoresis. You know, just us breathing normally, we, we will lose 300 to 400 mLs a day because of evaporation. So you need to take that into place too. These patients, these frail older uh, patients, or these young. Uh, now, the three to 400 mLs, that's for adults through evaporation just by breathing efforts. Infants, I'm not sure what they lose, but don't forget, adults are uh, the older adults are high, high risk for dehydration. Okay. Um, stroke victims, they're at high risk for pneumonia. They can have hemi hemiplegia. They're not taking those um, they're not moving, they're in the bed, okay? They're not sitting upright, especially if they can't get up, they're bedridden and they're not sitting up straight. They're not moving. They're not taking those good deep breaths with different types of daily activities, okay? Remember your medical terminology, tachypnea and what it means, right? Shallow increased respirations, Okay, abdomen accessory muscle use, right? They're really working to breathe. They're using their abdomen to breathe. You can actually see it. Okay, um, dyspnea, difficulty breathing, right? Remember what sputum is. You want to do. You want to assess it with coca, color, odor, consistency, and amount. Okay, that's going to become important. Let's see here. You're going to want to know your drug classes as well. Again, this is a huge review. Okay. Page 78 has some wonderful um, anti-infective medications, meaning your tetracyclines, your amino glycosides, your cephalosporins, your penicillins, your carbapenems, okay, and penicillins. These are important to know because if you get a question about 
let's say cefazolin and a patient has a penicillin allergy, are you going to put two and two together knowing that, hey, you know what? This patient has a penicillin allergy and they're about to get cefazolin, which is a first generation cephalosporin. I may want to be cautioned with this because um, clients, would, uh, they have an allergy to penicillin. They're more than likely going to have an allergy to cephalosporin because it is a first generation cephalosporin. It is derived from penicillin. Okay. So you want to be very cautious in those um, first, third, second, and fourth first, second, third, fourth generation of cephalosporins if the patient has a penicillin allergy, okay? Um, what's broad spectrum? What's, uh, what's used with gram negative, gram positive, okay? Um, let's see here. Mm -hmm. Continue, continue. Oh, yeah, Hesse hint, three to 400 ml of fluid loss a day, right here. Um, early signs of hypoxia, irritability, restlessness, okay? Brain's not getting enough O2. Early signs, your patient's restless. Most common cause of COPD is exposure to tobacco smoke, okay? Don't forget about your positions in the bed. Fowlers, semi-fowlers, Trendelenburg, high fowlers. Okay, supine, prone, sims, and when you would use them. Sims position is a great position for inserting a rectal tube or, or a suppository on a patient. Okay, more of the weight is resting on one of the clavicles and one of the legs as well. Okay, um, maybe cheese. Know your vaccine schedule, both for um, elderly patients and pediatric patients, okay? Because the HESI hint here, there's a lot of stuff about pneumonia. They must want us to know a lot about this. Pneumococcal vaccine at age 65 or older, or younger patients if they're at high risk, okay? Um, Mm -hmm. How to facilitate breathing, right? Don't forget, patients with COPD emphysema, they might find sitting on the edge of the bed with the arms folded on pillows, on a bedside table, might facilitate breathing better. Why? Because if your arms are up like this, you're able to expand your lungs better, okay? So that is one of the rationales here that can help you with positioning your patients if they have um, insufficient oxygenation. You might need to get um, a standing order for oxygen, okay? Let's see here. It's important to review bronchodilators, corticosteroids, anticholinergics, what they do, cholinergic versus anticholinergic. Let's see here. You want to read in your HESI book about TB, especially the Montox test, okay? You want to know about the area of induration. So you can review those key terms on page 87 of your HESI book. Um, second line drugs, TB, TB, HESI hints, um, definitely pay attention to those. Clients with teach, uh, TB, teaching is going to be important with this client. Drug therapy is normally six months or longer, okay? Um, we were doing chest tubes with a certain, I was doing chest tubes with a certain group of uh, students a couple weeks ago. You want to make sure that you read about chest tubes as well. These are to remove either blood or air from the intrapural space. And we need to expand the lung if there's a collapsed lung for any reason. Um, these patients need to be sitting up in a semi fowler's position, at least at minimum, okay? Let's see here. It says here, patient with lung cancer 
Chest tubes are not usually used because it's helpful in the mediastinal cavity where the lung fills up. Never mind that. Let me skip that part. I'm just reading to see what's going to be important here about chest tubes. The Hesse hints. The Hesse hints. I can't say enough about the Hesse hints. We're going to get into the renal system now. Acute, acute renal failure or AKI, right? Acute kidney injury. What's one of the easiest ways to read if a patient is in AKI is looking at their GFR. The GFR should be above 60, but if it has a sudden decrease less than 60, that could be a marker that your patient is more likely in acute kidney injury. There is stages to acute kidney injuries as well. Um, they call it pre-renal, intra-renal, and post-renal. So your pre-renal, before it gets to the kidneys, right? Hypovolemia may because of hemorrhage. Intra-renal, this is damage to the renal uh, parenchyma. We've got, this is from like nephrotoxic drugs, renal injuries, or acute pyelonephritis. And you got post-renal, this is an obstruction. This is an obstruction anywhere in the tubules to the urethral meatus, normally via calculi or BPH or um, tumors in the kidney, okay? Um, if a patient does have a GFR 60 or less, you will need to hold any type of nephrotoxic drugs or give it cautiously and advise the physician. For example, if I have a patient with a GFR of 32, I am not going to go in there and give them ibuprofen. I'm going to ask the doctor for an alternate medicine, maybe like Tylenol, because that is going to further deteriorate their kidneys. Okay. You will potentiate their decrease in kidney function. Okay. Um, electrolytes are affected too via the kidneys. That helps regulate our bicarb, our sodium, potassium. If a patient um, ends up needing to go on renal dialysis, what electrolyte are we going to worry about? We need to teach them about this in their diet, right? Potassium. Potassium needs to main, be maintained from 3.5 to 5, right? Because of the risk of cardiovascular changes, right? The electroconductivity of the, of the heart, okay? So that's what we're worried about. We need to teach them to avoid if they're on renal dialysis, foods high in potassium, your cantaloupes, your avocados, your broccoli, tomatoes, things that have potassium in it, okay? That could be um, one of your HESI hints as well. Yep, talks about potassium has a critical safe range because of how it affects the heart, okay? You need to know your different types of diuretics where it works at potassium sparing, right? Your spironolactone. You got your loop diuretics, works in the loop of Henle. Um, your thiazides, okay? You want to know those. Which ones are going to lose potassium? Which one's going to keep potassium? Lasix or furosemide, you're going to lose it, okay? Hydrochlorothiazide, you're going to lose it. Spironolactone, you're going to keep it. All right. Um Patients with renal failure retain sodium. What do we know about sodium? Its best friend is water. Sodium and water follow each other, results in clinical edema. Okay. Um, sorry. Let's see here. Okay. So now. Uh, we need to watch for signs of hyperkalemia if they're in um, end-stage renal or, re or if they have renal failure, okay? ESRD, end-stage renal disease. Dizziness, weakness, cardiac irreg irregularities, muscle cramps, diarrhea, and nausea. If they're having diarrhea, they're losing, uh, they're going to lose potassium that way too, though. So that may even... Um, help essentially, but we, it's still not a good sign. It is a sign of hyperkalemia if your patient is experiencing that, okay? Um, with excessive water retention, such as renal failure patients holding on to sodium, they are going to have um, 
um, let's see, excessive water retention, and then the sodium levels appear decreased or diluted. Okay, so we need to watch for those signs and symptoms. Now, your patients with um, end-stage renal disease, what happens? You get um, buildup of toxins in the blood, waste products from protein metabolism, okay? That is one of the primary cause of uremia. They're going to have some fluid volume alterations. We need to be mindful of excess fluid or fluid deficient symptoms in your patient. Okay. Before a patient goes to dialysis, one of the HESI hints is you should hold their antihypertensive medicines because now when they go to dialysis, they're going to lose fluid volume. And if you give them a antihypertensive medicine, you're going to potentiate their a hypotensive state potentially. Okay. Um, and it'll be filtered right out too. Okay. Need to make sure you know the terms anuric, oliguric. Okay. Um, anuric is less than 100 mLs a day. Oliguric is less than 400 mLs a day of urine. Okay. Um, let's see. Now, if a patient is in acute kidney injury, there are stages to that as well. There's an oligaric phase, a diuretic phase, and a recovery phase. In the diuretic phase, a patient is at highest risk to be hypotensive. So you want to be mindful of that, okay? Because they can go hypovolemic. They can also go hypokalemic or hyponatremic, okay? Their urine-specific gravity you want to be mindful of as well. You should know the norm of the urine specific gravity. Um, let's see here. Oh, strawberries are also high in potassium. Oh, also salt substitutes. You want to teach them to avoid salt substitutes because most patients will say, oh, if I can't have salt, I'll just go buy a salt substitute. No, no, no. Because a salt substitute is potassium. If you have it at home, read the back of it and throw it in the garbage. It is not good stuff. Okay. Um, remember if somebody is on hemodialysis, they might have an AV fistula, arterial venous fistula, meaning the arterial blood and the venous blood is now mended and, and flowing together. It's going to create the buzz, the thrill. Okay. The thrill is something you feel like on a roller coaster, the buzz, okay? That nervous feeling before you go on a roller coaster, a thrill. Thrill you feel. A brewery, you palpate. A brewery, you auscultate. You can hear the brewery. It sounds like uh, rushing water, okay? Um, let's see here. The major difference for the diastolates for hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis is the amount of glucose. Peritoneal dialysis dia diastolate is much higher in glucose. Okay. Uh, patients undergoing peritoneal dialysis, if the diastolate is left in the abdominal cavity too long, they are at risk for hyperglycemia. And again, I'm just going through these HESI hints. These are really important. Okay. Um, so what are we into now here? Postoperative care. UTIs. In an older adult, what could be the early sign that you're going to see that the patient is having a UTI? They might experience confusion, delirium. Okay. Um, which should go back to normal once the patient receives their medication as indicated for the infection, okay? But how can you objectively measure a UTI? Well, urinalysis, right? You can look at a urinalysis. We should never have ketones or protein in there. Slight red blood cells, um, but we shouldn't have any proteins, any ketones. CAS, variable. You should not... Not often you should have casts in, in the urinary and the urinalysis. You can also look at the CBC and check the white count, okay, and, and see if it's returned to um, within normal limits, okay? 
some other signs of infection, fever, chills, urinary frequency, urgency. That's, uh, again, I'm still with UTI. They may have hematuria. You don't have to see hematuria. It can be measured objectively with a urinalysis, and you'll see it presented as red blood cells in the urinalysis. Okay. Um, let's see here. Let's see, urinary obstruction. Ah, with patients, rewinding back a little bit to um, renal problems, whether it's pyelonephritis or pyelonephritis or hydronephrosis, your your physician or also you as the RN, you can assess the costovertebral angle, which is you get down to the posterior aspect where the twelfth rib would assume to be at. You place a hand. And you literally are just hitting your hand on the back of the patient's back and assessing for tenderness, okay? If there's any tenderness noted, that's a key indicator too, that we've got either pyelonephritis or some type of infection going on with the kidneys. All right, so moving on. Urinary system, urinary tract obstruction, again, Flank pain, flank pain, and flank pain are going to be another key indicator if they're having any uh, renal infections or issues. All right, so continuing with the urinary system, let's talk about BPH, right? Benign prosthetic hyperplasia, enlargement or hypertrophy of the prostate, okay? Tends to occur in men over 40. Uh, one of the most common procedures that they do for this is a TERP, transurethral resection of the prostate, T-U-R-P, TERP. Some of the most common drugs that they're going to prescribe is Proscar, Flomax, okay, Fenestride, which is Proscar, Um those are the most common ones that I've dealt with with having a patient that had a TERP or was ha or had BPH. Okay, um, your nursing assessment on this, yeah, they're standing up to void and they've got problems voiding. There's an a decrease each time they go to void. Okay, dribbling, they're gonna dribble, which is abnormal. They're gonna have recurrent UTIs and bladder distension. If your patient gets a TERP, more than likely they're going to be placed on continuous bladder irrigation, which is where they essentially it looks like two giant IV bags hanging on one or two IV poles. They hold 3,000 mLs of sterile water each bag. And they are, one is spiked and one is spiked into a Y line, line. And then it goes down to one line. That one line goes down to the patient, <clears throat> through the penis into the bladder. And what it's doing is irrigating, continuously irrigating, preventing blood clots. You're going to see hematuria with this. It should be pink. This is something you can titrate or adjust that little roller clamp. And you're watching the drip chamber and it's dripping, and you're watching it, and you're titrating it, you're either speeding it up or slowing it down. Know that if you slow it down, they're at risk for clotting off and going into a bladder spasm, which they need to be medicated with. Morphine's not going to work on this. They're going to need maybe a, a BNA suppository, which is, uh, I believe the name is Belladonna suppository. It works specifically. It's an antispasmodic. It's made out of opiate. Okay, and it's given rectally before any irrigation or during some bladder spasms, which frequently occur after a TERP, okay? Um, the clots, you'll have to manually evacuate from them, from the catheter. It's a very painful procedure for the males. It's uh, their, I'm going to say it's their version of giving birth. It's extremely painful, and they should be medicated immediately, immediately, Okay need to educate these patients on, on bladder spasms, okay? You need to make sure that you're emptying the catheter, emptying the Foley. 
this is where you need to record output and irrigation, okay? Um, but I'm, again, I'm just going through the HESI hints here. They need fully care at least twice a day. Once they finally stop with the clotting and the hematuria and you've managed them on a CBI, your doctor or the urologist is probably going to order the, the folate to be removed. If it is removed, you need to monitor the number and amount the client voice. If there's any dribbling, encourage fluids. Okay. Um, they need to report any frank bleeding immediately and make sure that they go home with any antispasmodics just in case that they do get a bladder spasm, which occurs frequently after a TERP. Okay. Um, how it, it, however, it is normal for the client to pass some small amounts of blood and small clots during the healing process, but they should be very small, very small, very minute amount of bleeding, and it should stop at one point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's shift gears, get into the cardiovascular system. All right. Hesse hint. Got another good one here. This one is uh, that the kidneys filter about one liter of blood per minute. If the cardiac output is decreased, you can guess that the amount of urinary output is decreased. So if you got an amount of urinary output decreased, it could be a sign that there's cardiac issues too. Okay. Um, let's see. 30 mLs. How much does the normal adult put out? 30 mLs an hour, right? 30 mLs an hour. You're going to hear that until you retire. Okay. Um, let's see here. What is angina? Chest pain, right? Decrease in oxygen supply. Common causes? Atherosclerosis. Plaque in the arteries. Hypertension. Coronary artery spasm, okay, or any activity that increases the heart's oxygen demand, like physical exertion or cold temperatures. These are your patients that could go, uh, that get a prescription for Endure or nitroglycerin, right? But what's modifiable, what's non-modifiable with chest pain, right? Heredity, background, age, what is modifiable? Your lipid levels, right? Your cholesterol levels, your lifestyle, smoking, obesity. Um, you can you can change lifestyles and eating habits to uh, resolve those items. Is what your Hesse book tells you. Stress, stress management, as well. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Mm -hmm. Administer no more than three nitro tabs in five minutes. One of the most common side effects of nitroglycerin is a horrible headache. Horrible. Okay. Um, males. Males. One of the most common questions that I've seen on, on different tests is teaching males about returning back to sexual activity or that they can take a nitro before intercourse prophylactically because that is going to require more of an oxygen demand from the heart. Okay. Um, you can teach them on nutritional information, right? Low fat diet, low cholesterol, different ways to lower the cholesterol or taking their cholesterol medications as prescribed. Um, page 100 has some wonderful anti-agonals, okay, which is your nitrites, your beta blockers, your calcium channel blockers, right? Your LOLs decrease your heart rate, okay? They also work a, a slight bit on blood pressure. Don't stop these abruptly though, okay? Um, let's see here. Adverse reactions. Yeah, they're going to cause a bronchospasm. So you want to use them, use this cautiously in your patients with asthma, COPD. Okay, your nitroglycerin key is keep them in a uh, 
in the original container. It's a little glass vial, but it needs to be protected from light so they can, um, oh, and make sure that they don't expire because that's a common one, okay? Um, your calcium channel blockers here, again, you're going to need to monitor uh, potassium. Don't stop these abruptly. They should be taken at least one hour before meals, right? This is like your nifedipine, your procardioid, your detalism or cardizem, okay? Some of the adverse, again, hypokalemia, edema. A lot of people that are on procardio or nifedipine, they get apeal edema, which is an adverse effect. They could get dizziness syncope, okay? Um, let's see here. What else want to go through? MIs, okay. Causes a thrombus, right? A clot, shock, or hemorrhage. Okay. We want to assess. Um, no males and females have different signs and symptoms of having an MI. Women will get uh, GI upset as well, which can mimic other disease processes going on in the body. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Remember Mona, when you're treating an MI, okay? Again, your HESI, it, it made its own HESI hint. I literally flipped the page and immediately seen, oh, hey, there's Mona right there. All right, uh, when the patients are having an MI, what can you anticipate? This might be a HESI question. What can you anticipate? Well, you're going to anticipate there that they're going to draw... Um, a CKMB, they're going to check the inflammation. They're going to drop troponins both now, okay, and five hours later um, after post-MI, okay. Um, CKMB, uh, measure, it's specific to myocardial cells, okay. That is going to help measure, quantify myocardial damage. Um, it peaks in about 10 to 24 hours. They're going to buy themselves an EKG at this point. You're going to monitor them for anxiety, restlessness, or impending doom or death. That is going to be key to assessing them if they're, if they, if somebody tells you that they have um, fear of impending doom or death, listen to them because they know their body best. And, and research shows that they have the feeling of impending doom or death. That's something um, could happen to them tragically. Okay. Um, let's see here. On page 102, there is a nice table of your post-MI uh, cardiac enzymes that they're going to look for, okay, myoglobin being one of them as well. Um, yeah. Going into strokes now, shifting the gears. Patient that you suspect having a stroke, we need to remember the acronym FAST, facial drooping, asymmetry, speech alteration, and time equals brain, okay? The longer that they're having a stroke, the more of the cells that are dying in the brain, okay? They've got two to three hours, depending on the book that you're reading, to get um, TPA if they're not having a hemorrhagic stroke, if it's an ischemic stroke, okay? Um, tissue plasminogen activator or the clot buster. Okay, TPA. Um, if a patient is having a stroke, we need to make sure that we monitor their blood pressure. It needs to maintain at a certain level. Your doctor will order that. Um, let's see here. You're going to need to watch for seizures, watch their glucose levels. All of these will be alterated, uh, altered, meaning the glucose level could be up. Even if they're not a diabetic, their glucose ranges will be off. Okay. Um, what else with these patients? Six weeks is all it takes for a contracture to stay permanent. Okay. So that is important to get PT and OT going immediately. How are they going to assess if it's a hemorrhagic stroke or an ischemic stroke? Those of you who have watched stroke alerts at other hospitals around here will have seen that once a stroke victim comes in, they are immediately taken in, they're getting an assessment, and they're right into CAT scan. Why? We need to make sure is the CT, if the CT can see bleeding or not, or no bleeding. That's we need to, and that's going to be um, key to verifying if it's hemorrhagic or ischemic, because you can see the bleeding on the brain through a CT, and that will steer the the care of that patient, okay? Um, number one, cause of stroke 
is hypertension. It's the silent killer. Um, if your patient has hypertension, you need to make sure that you're educating them on lifestyle modifiers, exercise, diet, stress, physical problems. Maybe if they've got, uh, unfortunately, genetic risk factors, those are non-modifiable. Positive family history for, for hypertension. Males have a higher risk of being hypertensive earlier than women. Um, ethnicity comes into play. African Americans are at higher risk than whites. What they don't have in this book is Hispanics. We are at high risk for hypertension as well and lipid problems, meaning cholesterol issues, high risk for stroke and diabetes as well. Okay. Um, in risk factor, uh, and there's another HESI in, in here for risk factors, heredity, race, alcohol abuse, increased salt intake, and oral contraceptives. Don't forget about that. Okay, that raises our blood pressure and puts us at risk for uh, a stroke. There is, um, steroids will increase your blood pressure and so will the estrogen found in the oral contraceptive. Okay. Um, what we need to assess for people with hypertension, don't just say, okay, oh, you got hypertension. Oh, well, no, assess them for a headache, okay? Assess them for a headache, Ass sit down with these patients. They need, they need support, okay? Because you're, you're, uh, people are getting diagnosed earlier and earlier. They need to watch one of the uh, most common reasons people go on renal dialysis is uncontrolled hypertension because hypertension will ruin your kidneys as well. It's a catch-22 with Western medicine. You get you have hypertension, you, we take a pill, and it costs us something else, right? How We're going to control our hypertension at the cost of another body system, but at least we can prolong the quality of life and or our other organs too. So it's important to teach patients to adhere to uh, being compliant with their medicines, okay? Um, what else here? Lipid levels will also um, put people at higher risk for hypertension, okay? Fat intake, diet. Um, mm -hmm, page 105 has a nice table on your, on your diuretics, okay? Because some of these are used for hypertension. You may get a patient that takes valsartan mixed with hydrochlorothiazide, okay? Okay. Um, that's definitely important to know. This is a very important table to know. Okay. Hydrochlorothiazide, for example, indications are severe. Hyper one of them is one of the indications is severe hypertension, adverse reaction, thirsty, dry mouth, drowsiness, hyperuricemia. Okay. Wow. Now, what you need to observe with this patient is you have to be cautious because taking hydrochlorothiazide could put them at risk for gout. Um, I mean, could potentiate if they already have a diagnosis of gout, okay? Um, if you have these patients taking these meds, they need to be cautious with alcohol relates to hypotension, also barbiturates or narcotics. Okay, and then it goes on and on here. Um 106, great table. This has all of your antihypertensive medicines on it that you'll see on the HESI. If you study this by the drug class, that's going to help you a lot. You don't have to verify the individual meds. You'll know the class as well. Um, peripheral, peripheral vascular disease. Okay. Again, your arteriosclerosis or atherosclerosis. And these are your patients that could develop uh, that have circulatory problems due to artificial or venous pathology, right? Your Reynolds disease, your Berger's disease, those are arterial diseases, okay? Um, Reynolds, your fingertips will turn blue. Cyanotic, right? Uh, let's see here. They're going to have pain when walking or elevation. They're, they couldn't experience intermittent claudication, right? Um, but, da, da, pain occurs, ulcers, venous stasis ulcers, right? Arterial ulcers. They're at risk for ulcers. 
period. Uh, risk for edema as well. Okay. Page 108 has some anticoagulants on it and what you should um, watch out for with them. That is important. Let's see. One, one has a question I remember as well was uh, AAA, abdominal aortic aneurysm. This is one that people, um, it's, uh, it's often asymptomatic, that comes on uh, precipitously. I had a patient that had a AAA. They experienced it while driving. Um, and 911 got, uh, emergency services got to him in time. We actually got to save his life. Um, one of the chief complaints is they can feel their heart beating, okay, with abdominal or lower back pain. Okay, we shouldn't be able to feel our own heart beating. Okay, we can palpate it, but we shouldn't be able to feel it internally. Um, if a patient feels that they have a tearing sensation in the chest, that is signs of a dissecting aortic aneurysm. Okay, this is a HESI hint. They need vital signs Q1 hour. Neuro checks, your respiratory status, remember urinary output, why? Because if it's a decreased cardiac output, you're gonna see a decreased urinary output and you need to assess their pulses. Okay. I'm just running through here, guys. Running through here. Um, I'm probably gonna skip through some of these. Let's see. You're going to need to know your inotropic drugs and what they do. Page 115 has that on there related to heart failure. I suggest learning heart failure with pictures, like on Picmonic. You need to include in your study plan what epinephrine does and how it works on the body. It's also a neurotransmitter. Um, see here. GERD. They love testing on GERD. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. I'm going to stop right here. Uh, GERD is a result of an incompetent lower esophageal sphincter that allows the regurge of gastric acid into the esophagus. If going untreated, um, one it is super uncomfortable for your patient. Uh, it can erode the esophagus. Um, one of the most common modifiable um, modifiers is lifestyle, exercise, diet, okay, um, food choices, um, again, diet. These patients need uh, teaching. They should avoid smoking as well. They should stop eating three hours before they go to bed. The head of the bed should be elevated. Um, you can teach them about the most commonly prescribed meds, which is antacids, okay? Um, surprisingly, something that can aggravate their symptoms is chocolate. So you need to teach them about modifying their intake of chocolate, caffeine as well, and strawberries, sadly, okay? Um, let's see what else they got here. Your GI drugs are on page 121. You should read those as well. Peptic ulcer disease, right? Want to, um, let's see, these can be caused by H. pylori. Types of ulcers that you can get, you want to know. Um, I mean, not the types of ulcers. The symptoms that can go with it, belching, burping, um, epigastric pain that radiates to the back, um, which are relieved by antacids. Those are typical signs of your peptic ulcer diseases. That's why we ask the pain assessment, where is it radiating to? That's your job to be the expert in that, okay? Um, stress can exacerbate the ulcers, so you want to talk about stress reduction as well. 
Sorry, guys. Sorry. IBS. Inflammatory bowel diseases. Both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Okay. Let's see. So let, let's talk about this here. My voice is slowly going. <clears throat> I would definitely read page <clears throat> 122, 123 about Crohn's. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So getting into Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, both are inflammatory bowel diseases. The difference is Crohn's, you got some, so if you picture the bowel, okay, you're ascending, transcending, descending, both large and small intestine, there is patchy areas of inflammation. Whereas in ulcerative colitis, there is continuous and uniform inflammation of the large bowel, like commonly sigmoid colon down to the anus, okay? Um, those are the most common differences in them. And again, both are inflammatory bowel diseases. It just depends on where the inflammation is, okay? Um, we want to be cautious in giving these patients opiates because it decreases gastric motility, right? Puts them at risk for an ileus. They couldn't end up with a colostomy bag if it potentiates it that much further. Sorry. I don't mean to drink and talk, but... My mouth is getting dry. Um, what else they got here? So again, these affect the mucosal of both of those disease processes, which brings me into my next one, uh, diverticulitis. Diverticulitis in nursing is where you've got... Uh, pouches in the wall of the intestine, right? And these pouches, um, we all have them. They're a part of our intestine. It usually goes um, unnoticed until there is a further problem. Meaning if you've got this patient with uh, diverticular disease, some of the symptoms could be, well, will be abdominal pain. They could get a fever. They could get nauseous. Um, they're going to have changes in bowel habit habits as well. Okay, so what's going on? You got these pouch-like protrusions in the wall, and whatever we eat can get caught into the pouch, essentially. So like your um, uh, raw vegetables, like raw broccoli, if you chew a raw piece of broccoli and eat it, it's going to be pretty rough, and it can get caught in that pouch, okay, in the intestinal wall. It'll inflame become painful and, and at that point is where it can get infected at okay in the diverticula there um some of the complications that could come with it is bleeding or an abscess obstruction peritonitis or it can create a fistula we don't want any of those some of the most common medicines for this one is flagell you're going to get an antibiotic and an antifungal at the same time because of where it's what's going on and where it's going on at, right? Okay. Um, typically, typically pain is seen in the left lower quadrant with this one. All right. Um, hopefully we like to resolve diverticulitis with um, IV hydration and those two medicines I was talking about, but sometimes you can't and they're going to need a surgery for this. Hopefully the patient doesn't need um, a colostomy bag with this if I don't know how much of the bowel can get um, a disorder, but we want to prevent further problems by this one. So what increases this risk factor, right? Uh, a decreased amount of fiber intake, obesity, alcohol use, smoking, and a sedentary lifestyle. Things are not going to be moving the way that they should in a sedentary lifestyle. Okay, um, we want to prevent any abscesses, right? We want to teach this client diet to a diet to follow. No nuts, no seeds. Cook your vegetables. Cook your fruits, right? 
So with diverticulitis, there's a couple of phases we need to follow. During the acute phase when they're seeing you in the hospital for their symptoms, they're probably going to be placed on an MPO status, right? We need to regain control of the bowel, essentially. Um, we're going we're gonna to graduate them to taking on a fluid diet, uh, a liquid diet, or if hopefully they don't end up in surgery, right? That's what we want to avoid. Now there is a recovery phase where we're going to slowly get them back to solids, but we're going to decrease their fiber intake. Why? Because right now all these diverticula were so inflamed uh, all, and, and possibly infected that we don't want to potentiate that. Um, but however, in the recovery phase, these people will go on um, a high fire, high, high fiber diet. Okay. That way, and they're probably going to get on a bulk forming laxative to prevent pooling of food in the pouches, right? Because in a sedentary lifestyle, what's going on with fecal matter? It's sitting in there. And when it sits in the intestines, that's when it has the greatest risk of in one infection, two irritation to the surrounding mucosal area. Okay. So that's part of the rationale of why they want to be put on, um, those bulk forming laxatives like Metamucil as a daily regimen, they're going to need about three liters a day of a fluid intake. Okay. We want to avoid constipation for these patients um, because we're going to put them at risk for more issues. Let's get into intestinal obstruction, right? Your bowel obstructions. So your bowel obstruction, partial or complete blockage of intestinal flow. What is going on? Do we have an ileus? Do we have um, adhesions? Meaning if they haven't had any prior surgery, the, the bowel could adhere to another part of the ab intra-abdominal region, like another organ or another mucous membrane, okay? That's where it can adhere to. Um, Adhesions are caused by um, disorder of the bowels, blockages, or if they've had any previous surgery, puts them at higher risk. That is a HESI hint as well. It's on page 124. Okay. Um, so there's mechanical and non mechanical bowel obstruction. Your, your non mechanical, that's your paralytic, paralytic ileus. Um, it's the inability to the bowel to function by itself, basically, okay? Um, people can get um, in obstructions by hernias, interception, tumor, tumors, okay? Or neurogenic causes or vascular causes. If it's a vascular cause, then you've got problems with the mesenteric artery leads to a, an infarction of the gut and necrotic bowel, okay? So it's not going to work. It's got no blood flow. It's becoming necrotic tissue is dying in the bowel. Okay. That is severe. These clients are probably going to get, they are going to get an NG tube for uh, decompression. If their bowel obstruction is so bad, I have seen fecal matter come be vomited out of a patient before the NG tube got placed. And then when I finally placed the NG tube, what came out was fecal matter through the NG tube into the uh, wall container. Okay. And it absolutely smells horrible. Give them mouth care. Don't just continue on your day. Remember, if you were that patient, how would you feel? Brush their teeth, help them brush their teeth. They can't swallow it, but you can assist them with e irrigating the mouth. Okay. If they can, or if they can just, if they have the uh, gag reflex, if they got the ability to speak, they can help you. They can brush their own teeth and spit out the, the, the toothpaste and you can help them with some mouthwash, give them uh, a care for their face, give them a warm towelette or a warm washcloth, make them comfortable. They're going through a very rough time right now with the, an intestinal uh, bowel obstruction. Okay. This is a whole uh, life-changing event. They could end up with a colostomy bag because of this. Okay. Remember how to measure for an NG tube, right?
down to the xiphoid process. Okay, um, make sure that if you're placing an NG tube to suction, low intermittent suction is about 80 on the uh, on the medical vacuum. We want to do not go over 120. Okay, do not go over 120. Um, let's see here. Ba, 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 ba. So I'm just going to tell you, most of the stuff that's in this HESI book is what I've experienced taking care of these patients. If you have an NG tube to suction, you are going to put the patient at risk for hypokalemia because through an NG tube, they're going to lose through gastric uh, contents coming out potassium. Same thing with diarrhea. You're going to lose potassium. Uh, these people need to be repositioned. You can irrigate the NG tube with normal saline. You need to assess, you need to coca whatever's coming out of the patient, color, odor, consistency, and amount, okay? Um, these patients need a lot of teaching, pre-op uh, and post-op. Not going to teach them intra-op because they're going to be under sedation, right? These patients are going to need to be on I's and O's. They're going to need a Foley catheter, okay, as well, because we want to maintain, one, if they've got adequate cardiac output, they'll have adequate urinary output, and we want to monitor them, okay? We want to monitor for signs and symptoms of dehydration. There you go. You've got the Foley. You can check the urinary color. And like I said, you want to monitor electrolyte values, monitor potassium, your magnesium is going to go down with nasogastric suctioning or, or surgery, okay, will we'll, um, affect the magnesium level as well. All right. Um, let's see. Pain. Pain is going to be one of those things. Of course, you're going to have to monitor pain with them. Same thing if they were to have um, surgery anywhere else. Pain. It's the fifth vital sign. We're always doing pain. Okay. Um, let's see if they do come back with the colostomy bag, unfortunately, you want to maintain the stoma, meaning the color. It should be nice, beefy red. It should not be pale or dark in color. Okay. Cause if it's pale, it's signifying a loss of blood flow to that area or possible ischemia. We don't want that. We want a nice beefy red stoma. Okay. Um, If you are providing care to the stoma, okay, um, make sure you guys know the difference between colostomy and ileostomy. Your med search two book, I think it was page like 790 something. Anyways, uh, there is a chapter 26, 27. Anyway, you can see pictures of ileostomy. Ileostomy is going to uh, bypass the bladder. So you're going to see some bowel contents and urine. You may only see urine. Okay, ileostomy has a much smaller stoma than the colostomy bag. Okay, um, you need to read on page 126 the diets for ileostomies and colostomies. Okay, uh, you can teach patients with colostomy that yes, they can still have sex. That's important. They have colostomy bag covers, okay? Uh, it's because some, it's not just for older people. It can happen at any age. Okay. Um, let's see. Cirrhosis, another one, page 126, right? P people with cirrhosis, they're going to have um, jaundice. They could be, ha uh, ja they can have jaundice of the skin, jaundice of the sclera. Rationale that they could have puritis is they've got bile coming through they're uh they're sweating out bile essentially it's coming right through their pores and their skin and it's causing the itch okay um they have chronic biliary obstruction again another rationale for the 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 jaundice um let's see here cirrhosis is a degeneration of liver tissue causing enlargement, fibrosis, and scarring. Again, causes of cirrhosis is not only limited to alcohol ingestion, but viral herpes, exposure to hepatotoxins like taking too much Tylenol, infections, congenital abnormalities, 
chronic biliary obstruction, severe right-sided heart failure, and idiopathy, meaning they have no idea where it came from. Okay. Uh, typically, your history will include um, alcohol intake, prescriptive medicines, and street drugs, right? Um, physical findings, they're weak. They got weight loss. Um, you can palpate the liver. Abdominal growth increases. They've got uh, jaundice. They have uh, feeder hepaticus, which is that musty breath, right? Um, you'll also see ascites. How can you assess ascites? That is with a fluid wave test. You put your hand on the abdominal cavity like this and you tap one side of the abdomen. You'll watch it ripple like throwing a rock into a pond, okay? Um, the bilirubin comes through the skin, okay? Um, they're going to have chalkier clay-colored stools. Um, if you get a question regarding feeder hepaticus, it's a distinctive breath odor with chronic liver disease. Again, these are all HESI hints. Um, let's see here. What else? They got Paracentesis we had an experience the other day. It was a wonderful experience. We were at a facility and there was a patient with an already low blood pressure about to get Lasix, about to go down for a paracentesis and that had morphine, right? That is a recipe for circulatory collapse, possibly. So we wanna be cautious, we wanna be prudent about it. Okay, um, if these patients have cirrhosis, they're at risk for having esophageal varices, which if they rupture, they can hemorrhage, they can die from those, okay? Um, one of the most common treatments is a balloon tamponade. Another problem with um, cirrhosis is you're going to have uh, ammonia is not broken down as usual in the liver. Therefore, the ammonia level rises. Uh, the metabolism slows down because they remain in the system for longer. Where does all our drugs that we take in go? It goes to the liver to be metabolized. When our liver is affected, we can't metabolize that. I'll, I'll also, our clotting factors are going to be um, affected as well because our uh, coagulation factors generate from our liver. Okay. Um, let's see here. Uh, these patients are going to have vitamin supplements, A, B, complex C, and K, possibly. And you're going to monitor I and O's. Let's see here. Um, let's see. Low sodium, low potassium, low fat, and high carbohydrate diet. Um, those are indicated as well for a patient with cirrhosis. If they have uh, cirrhosis, they need may have earned themselves the drink of lactulose, which lactulose will give them diarrhea as, it, as it's uh, decreasing the ammonia level because it's so high with cirrhosis. It's a terrible tasting drink. It's orange in color. It's it's in a um, unit dose of, uh, I think it's 30, 30 mLs that comes in. Okay. Um, so you want to you wanna end up teaching your patients about that. Let's see here. You can read about hepatitis on page 128. <laughs> Pancreatitis is on page 129. These patients, you may see them there. They may, um, they may have, uh, in chronic pancreatitis, you're going to see weight loss, jaundice, dark urine, and steatorrhea, or fatty um, stools that float. Okay. Put them on MPO status if they're in acute pancreatitis. It's very painful. They might be in a fetal position that also helps relieve the abdominal pain that they are going through. Dilaudid and fentanyl are indicated for this patient. They may have an NG tube and you may get TPN prescribed for this patient. We're going to monitor blood sugar with giving TPN as well. Okay. Um, we want to monitor. So when you have pancreatitis, you're going to have problems with low calcium levels. So we want to monitor for tetany, uh, tetany, muscle twitching, cramping, seizures, and altered tendon reflexes and spasms. Okay. 
see what else with seizures. Sitting up and leaning forward reduces the pain. Like I was saying, that fetal position, okay? Um, they're going to need analgesis. They're going to need pancreatic enzymes like uh, Viocase with meals and snacks. Um, we're going to monitor their stools and teach them for a bland, low-fat diet and avoid foods rich in alcohol and caffeine. Okay. Um, yeah. Gallbladder, cholecystitis, right? Or cholelithiasis. Cholecystitis is an inflammation of the gallbladder, and cholelithiasis is formation or presence of stones in the gallbladder. Typically, the gallbladder is removed. Uh, this is a disease greater in females who are multiparous or overweight. Okay. These the treatment is going to be IV hydration, antibiotics, pain control, and SEDs are going to get for it. But if it's too far gone or too full of stones, you might be a candidate for a cholecystectomy. Okay. Um, hopefully, if they can dissolve um, the the stones with with bile salts, they're going to give to them. But they rarely use that anymore. Most of the time, they're going to get an ERCP. Um, or a cholecystectomy because the lithotripsy is not covered by most insurances. Um, if they do undergo an ERCP, they're going to feel sick. Okay. They may feel sick because they still have stones. They're crushed and um, left to path, pass on their own. Uh, these patients may become prone to pancreatitis. Um, typically, when a patient is going to have their gallbladder taken out, they do it um, hopefully it will not be an open cholecystectomy where they have this long midline incision or transverse incision. They normally take it out with uh, three punctures and one small um, incision into the belly button region where they actually pull out the gallbladder. Um, pretty quick recovery time most of the time. They're going to need to be taught um, low-fat diet lifestyle changes, um, and of course you monitor their vital signs as, as a post-op patient as you normally would. They're gonna have pain afterwards, meaning if they have a cholecystectomy and they tell you they've got shoulder pain, that's because they've had all these gases coming into their abdomen area so the surgeon can see where they're going, that the gas rises right to the shoulder blades and gives them pain. How do you get rid of it? They got to walk. They got to walk and pass flatus. Okay. That's what they need to do. They need to avoid spicy or fatty foods and reduce the caloric intake. Um, typically, you'll see this in female patients after 40 who are overweight. Okay. Um, Definitely want to read about Graves' disease, goiter, hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's disease. Cushing syndrome, Addison syndrome. Know your normal A1C level. Okay. Brushing through some of this because I have to, I got to wrap this up. You want to know your peak onset and duration of insulins on page 139. It's got them on there. Okay. You want to know about um, metformin. It's a biguanide. Most common proprietary name is glucophage. Okay. Um, you want to know signs and symptoms of hyperglycemia versus hypoglycemia. Rheumatoid arthritis, lupus. Osteoporosis as well, kyphosis, what that means. Common types of fractures. Joint replacement. Know the names of hip replacement, knee replacements, 
care of the stump with amputation. Neurosensory, you want to read up on glaucoma and cataracts. What to do in an attached, detached retina, that is uh, ocular emergency, eye trauma. Okay. Some of the most common uh, treatments of glaucoma on page 152. Hearing loss. Glass cow coma scale. On page 155. You want to know about head injury. ICP. 5 to 15 is the normal for ICP. Um, what you want to monitor with ICP. You want to know what, um, if there's head trauma, what it looks like, the battle sign, the raccoon eyes. Okay. How are you going to verify if the fluid that is leaking through the nasal cavity is CSF, the halo sign, right? Or ass assess if there is any glucose. Spinal cord injuries, you can read up on page 159. Myasthenia gravis, page 161. Parkinson's disease. guillain barr syndrome. 162 and 163 in your HESTI book. You want to know the most common medicines for Parkinson's. There's dopamine replacements, that carbidopa, levodopa, okay? The pill rolling that they will um, show as a clinical sign and system, the mask, face, the shuffling gait, the tremors, okay? Um, I'm flying through this real quick here, but you need to formulate your study plan to help you. Stroke, CVAs, right? I, I would definitely uh, take a pause and look at page 164, how it talks about right-sided stroke versus left-sided stroke. You definitely want to know that. There's uh, a lot of HESI hints about strokes. They love testing on this. Page 165 talks about apraxia, dysarthria, dysplasia, aphasia, agraphy, Alexia and dysphagia, okay? Alexia is the uh, loss of the ability to read, okay? Um, let's see here. Hematology and oncology, you wanna know about anemia, the normal iron level in the body. You can read up on leukemia, page 168. Anti-emetics are on page 173. Hodgkin's disease and the HESI hint to go with it. Uterine prolapse. Cancer of the cervix. Cancer of the prostate. Burns. Definitely want to take a peek at page 186. They love testing you about the nines regarding burns. Infection is one of the most common reasons why people die after a burn. Okay, and that will, once you get to burns, that completes chapter four. Okay. Um, that's what I have today for a HESI review. I sped through some of it, but I urge you the, the things that I said uh, as I was speeding through the last part of this video that you wanna make your notes on, pictures, research, okay? Before your HESI, get yourself prepared. All right, good luck. Take care. Thanks for watching.